If you'll open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes this letter to the church at Corinth. It's the most personal of his letters as he addresses issues that have to deal with his being attacked, attacked by the super apostles and false apostles who'd come to Corinth seeking to cash in on the largesse that had come to that church. The church had grown tremendously. There was a lot to offer there. There were lots of issues, as we saw in the first letter. But part of what was going on is that Paul's plans had changed. And because of that, some people criticized him. Some seized the opportunity to denigrate him and cast doubt upon him as an apostle in seeking to gain a gathering and a following for themselves. That's the backdrop as we begin reading at verse 12. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, this is the word of God. Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom but on God's grace. For we do not write you anything you cannot read or understand. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Because I was confident of this, I wanted to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes, and no, no? But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. I call God as my witness and I stake my life upon it that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. It was Robert Burns in one of his writings who said, made reference to the best laid plans of mice and men. Sometimes, no matter how carefully we plan, life happens. Things occur that we did not plan for, that we could not plan for. Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. So to make a change is much more profitable than to keep plowing ahead. It's what happened with Paul. And some people were on the outs with him because of it. We have to do a little reconstructive work as we take the text and what we know before and after and the illusions that are made. But in a nutshell, what happened is after the first letter, some people didn't respond very well. 
So Paul made a quick trip. Uh, that trip did not go well. So rather than make another visit, as he had planned, he sent a letter, a letter that we don't have, that obviously the Holy Spirit did not want us to have or we would have it. But in that letter, uh, he spoke truth, uh, insisting that situation there should be dealt with, at least one situation. He called it, in another place, a sorrowful letter. And he sent Timothy and Titus. And they corresponded and they took it for him. Uh, some said, Paul, you said you were going to come twice and you didn't, so we can't trust you. You tell us one thing and do another. Some used this occasion to say, oh, wow, you're strong in your letters. Boy, you write tough stuff, but when you show up, you're all conciliatory and gracious. And when you come toward the end of this letter in one place, he says, you either deal with it or when I come, you'll find out. I can be just as tough in person as I am in my letters. What you see in this passage is Paul explaining what had happened and what his motivation was. You see a man who humbles himself because he loves these people. These are his children in the faith. You do a whole lot for your children that you wouldn't do for other people by way of making right relationships and turning the other cheek and biting your tongue and humbling yourself in order to maintain healthy relationships. You become more vulnerable with those people because you value and cherish that relationship. And so what we see Paul doing is modeling for us how we ought to treat relationships with believers. And you'll notice he begins by saying, now this is our boast. He says, this is something we can put out there and tell you without any equivocation. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you with integrity and sincerity. Can you say that in your relationships, especially with other believers, you are a person of integrity and sincerity? I know sometimes I've heard that people have said so-and-so that sounds really uh, difficult difficult for me to take and usually it comes by way of a third party and you begin to wonder what their purpose is in telling you that so and so said this but often that's been diffused because I say well you know I know so and so and I know they would never say anything like that and mean it the way you've communicated integrity because I know that person. I knew that wasn't the relationship that I had with them. Are we living lives so that our relationships with one another are built on integrity and sincerity? That's where Paul begins. He said, we've done this not relying on worldly wisdom, but on grace. In our relationship with you, we don't make plans. We don't conduct ourselves just by the wisdom of the world. But rather, we seek to deal with you by grace. Isn't that how Christians deal with one another or should deal with one another? Shouldn't we be gracious in our relationships with one another? Shouldn't we be people who are known for our dependence upon God's grace? Are we people that other believers know, we're people of the word, that we will seek to do what God has taught us to do regardless of the cost? 
And if we have to say we're sorry, we'll say we're sorry. If we need to explain, we will explain. But I want you to note that Paul here puts, takes his hat in his hands and humbly makes his case to these people. He could have said, look, I'm the apostle who came at the threat of my own life. I came, worked with my own hands to feed myself that I might bring you the gospel. A gospel, by the way, that stratically changed your life. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't throw down the apostle card and say, you owe me. How can you be upset with me? I should be upset with you that you would even think such things. You ever dealt with somebody like that? You don't have very deep, strong relationships, do you? Because it's not built on grace, it's built on power. And Paul says, look, I don't make decisions based on worldly wisdom, but on grace. That's the way I got to you to begin with. The Holy Spirit brought me to you. He says, we don't write you anything you cannot read or understand. I haven't written you cryptic messages saying, well, I'll be here and I'll do this, or you need to do this, or the Spirit says do that, and yet that's not how it is. That's what he was accused of doing by some. And he says, and I hope that as you understood us in part, you'll come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Get this. He is affirming their relationship together as brothers and sisters in Christ. You see what he's doing? He's saying the basis of our relationship is Christ and I pray that someday you will understand and you'll be able to boast of me the way I will boast of you on the day of the Lord Jesus. He doesn't cut them off. He doesn't lay down these parameters and say, oh, if you do this or if you don't do that, then we're not going to have a good relationship. No, he's dealing honestly with them. So in verse 15, he says, because I was confident of that, because I was confident of who you are in Christ, I wanted to visit you first. So he says, here was my original plan to make two visits. Was I fickle? Verse 17, that's what he was, I think we could quote that verbatim that he was accused of being fickle. In the emails that went around, oh, that Paul, he's fickle. I'm convinced that word was contained in the messages that got back to Paul. Oh, he's fickle. You can't count on him. I understand that attitude. Uh, Tuesday they were predicting snow, right? It's going to start at 1 o'clock in the morning, and by the time you get up Wednesday, you're going to have trouble getting to work. Then they said at 11 o'clock. It's going to start in about 3 o'clock. So about 6.30 I get up and there's nothing nowhere. So Kay had gone home after the circle meeting lest she get snowed in in Bisco when she needed to be in Sanford. And I look out there and I say, okay, my wife is in Sanford, I'm in Bisco, and there's no snow anywhere. It's a grand conspiracy between the weathermen and Walmart to sell eggs and milk and bread. And that's what I wrote in an email to her. <laughs> and of course, I hit the send button and I feel very good with myself that I vented my spleen and I'll get on to important work of Bible study and Ah, about about eight o'clock, I look out the window. Now gone, it is snowing. <laughs> At eight thirty, it was beginning to cover the grass. At a quarter to nine, it was beginning to creep out on the edge of the street. And by the way, if that's your front end in front of my house, <laughs> pick it up on the way home. <laughs> If it ain't yours, pick it up and get rid of it for me. <laughs> By 9.30, I said, oops, <laughs> I 
open mouth, insert foot. Fickle. And you see, that's what I was accusing the weather people of. Oh, you just do this and get us all hyped up. Because, you see, I'm just as bad as any kid waiting for school to be canceled. I couldn't wait to get up and see if it had snowed. And I was so disappointed. That's why they accused Paul. You're fickle. You say one thing and the wind changes and you do something else. He says, no, I wasn't that. Did I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath it's yes, yes, no, no? Could be, might be, possibly, we'll see. Every kid knows that answer. Can we do this? We'll see. That means no. <laughs> well, we got to get in the yard mode. Got to get the dishes washed. Got to get this done. Got to get that done. I know what that means. We'll see means that if the stars align perfectly and Jesus doesn't come and all of a sudden you're really in a good mood and we have been perfect all day, maybe. <laughs> you see, Paul says, that's not how I make decisions that affect ministry and life and you. And then he resorts to a, a, an element of argument that was common in, in disputations and arguments. And what he does is he appeals to the message he had delivered them because in that day and time you just didn't separate the message and the messenger. Because if the messenger was unworthy, the message was unworthy. I think that's a good rule to follow. Be careful who you follow. That's why I always tell you, go back to the word because that's the word of God. That messenger won't fail you. So he says, here's the message, but as surely as God is faithful, our message to you, the gospel we preached to you was not yes and no. For he says, the son of God who was preached to you, the gospel that was preached to you, the Jesus who was declared to you by me and Silas and Timothy. That was not yes and no, but always yes. The promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. And we were the amen. Me and Silas and Timothy as we declared that message and kept preaching it as we led you to Christ, as we discipled you in the faith. The promises of God are yes and our preaching, our witnessing, our teaching to you was the amen, the so be it. The promises of God are true and we are just affirming them to you. And that's the basis of our relationship. I mean, that's the basis of our relationship here. I know some of you are kin folks. Most of you are kin folks. All of you practically are kin folks. <laughs> well, that doesn't mean you have to have relationship with one another. You see, what knits us together at the most foundational of levels in the church of the Lord Jesus is the gospel. We own the same gospel. We claim the same Savior. We hold to the same promises. We seek to live by the same truths. That's what Paul is saying to these people. Here's how we're knit together. Here's the foundation of our relationship. It's the gospel. The word of God that's true that we've affirmed to you. Notice it says... He has set his seal of ownership on us. Not only us who bring the word, but you who've received it, all of us. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing that these promises are good and all that I've said to you will come to pass. I'll tell you what, when you stand beside that fresh grave, it's either real or you need to go home and find something that is. You can't escape it. You can't go into the land of denial unless you're really good at playing games. Either the gospel is true and there is hope for the life to come or we've got to find another message. 
Paul says, he has given us his spirit within our hearts, guaranteeing what is to come. Not only the forgiveness of sin now, not only eternal life beginning now, but all that's promised to come. That message is true. Not because I said it, but because it's the word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your lives demonstrates that the gospel is true. And then you notice verse 23 says, I call God as my witness. I don't know who else you could call to the box to be a more powerful witness. For either God will say yes or he will condemn you. There's no middle ground. It won't say, well, God's a pretty good witness. I call God as my witness and I stake my life on it. Do you think he's serious about what he's saying? These aren't just throwaway words. It's not, you know, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. You know, the things you used to say as a kid. No. He says, I stake my life on it. Here's why I didn't come back. To spare you pain. He says, as I looked at things and prayed about things, I realized that a return trip this soon would do nothing to help the cause. It would only agitate, aggravate. So I sought God, allowing the spirit who is in you to work. It wasn't because I didn't care, because I had a better opportunity. It wasn't because you're not as important as you used to be. All those things were probably said about Paul. He said, it's because I did not want to grieve you, to hurt you, to lord it over your faith, for you to think that I'm the one cracking the whip, that I'm God. No, I'm just God's servant. For you see, I work with you for your joy. A joy that is yours by faith, a faith in which you stand firm. So he said, I made up my mind I wouldn't make another painful visit. For if I grieve you, if I grieve you, who's left to make me glad but you whom I've grieved? Now, Paul lost his family because of the gospel. The Corinthians were his family, and he says, If I grieve you, who's left to bring me joy? He said, I wrote as I did so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should make me rejoice. I didn't want another confrontation. I did not want another time of having to plead with you to do the right thing. He says, I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. The Apostle Paul. You see a whole different side of Paul than is usually depicted. This hard little man, former Pharisee, who can endure such great physical trials and spiritual trials, but who's hard, says hard things. He said, I wrote that with the ink mixed with tears. That's how much I care about you. That's how much what happens to you affects me. And I wrote it not to grieve you, but because I love you so. And the preacher who stands in the pulpit and refuses to call sin, sin, refuses to point out that crimson stain, refuses to tell you how desperately you need Jesus Christ, is not one who loves you. There's not one who will weep over you. You see, those who love you, those who care for you, those who delight in you, those for whom you're a joy and a blessing, they'll tell you the truth because they love you that much. And that what you tell your kids? If you love them. So many parents 
love themselves more than they love their kids, and that's why they take the easy way out. Man, it takes real love to tell your kid they're doing wrong, especially when they're grown. You don't hound them, you don't hassle them. You say, I love you too much to not tell you the bridge is out, and if you keep going, you go into destruction. You see, that's what Paul says. And as believers, we have that relationship in Christ. So, do we deal with each other as people of integrity and sincerity because we're in the gospel? Many, many churches today are full of torment and strife and turmoil. And I'm convinced it's because so many claim Christ, but they don't really know him. Because isn't it amazing when you deal with people on the basis of the gospel, seeking God and his grace as people of integrity and sincerity, you don't jump at the first thing that rubs you wrong. You say, well, I know so-and-so. He didn't mean it that way. I know him. And if you have doubts, you go and say, hey, I heard you said this, and, and I, don't, I just don't want there to be anything between us. And if I misunderstood, let me tell you what, sometimes those are the sweetest times. Oh, no, I didn't say that. I didn't mean that that way. Or I was just upset and blowing steam, and you just happened to catch a little of it. Will you forgive me? What about you? You see, you can't be a person of integrity and sincerity in the gospel if you're not walking with the Christ of the gospel. And my prayer is that our relationships with each other will continue to grow and grow and grow in grace as we become more and more in Christ, people of integrity and sincerity in the gospel. Father, thank you. Thank you that sometimes these sermons are so hard to preach because these people have modeled for me these truths, being gracious and kind, sincere, grounded in the gospel. Thank you, and we pray that you would help us to live that way, always, so that we'd be known to each other as people who love Jesus, people of integrity and sincerity, so that our first thought is not negative, but good. Oh, so-and-so, they're not like that. And we let it go. And what could faster disappears. Oh, that's what grace does. More and more make us people of grace, for we ask it in Jesus' name.